The beginning of our chapter 3 is on exponential functions, but later on in this chapter we're going to talk about his inverse, which is the logarithmic function. And a lot of this is going to feel like review from Algebra 2 at the beginning, but we're going to take this a little further than what you saw in Algebra 2, so uh, I promise that you won't be too bored for too long. But this beginning is going to feel very review-y, but you know what, let's be honest, I think we could all stand a little review at this moment. All right, so um, exponential functions is our focus for today. And we uh, have a lot of vocab here, but an exponential function, the idea is you have to remember oh, that it is in the form a times b to the x power, where the variable x has to be in the exponent position, thus the exponential growth that you're going to see. Um, be careful, though, not anything that has an exponent is an exponential function. The input variable has to be in the exponent position. So keep that in mind. The other issue is if you have a negative x for the exponent, that's going to turn it into a rational function, which is not an exponential function. Oh no. Back up, Abruzzo. It's not going to turn it into a rational function. <laughs> it's going to turn it into a different type of function than what you first appeared. So we're going to um, think about some vocab words like exponential growth and exponential decay, and we have to remember our exponent rules and what a negative exponent does to it. Sorry, it's a little early for me, apparently. All right, moving on. Um, an exponential function that has a base not equal to 1, because if it's just 1, you're not going to have any sort of growth. But if it's a base greater than 1, then we have exponential growth. But if your base is between 0 and 1, not including 0 or 1, we have an exponential decay. So um, we see some examples of, let's start with exponential growth. So 3 to the x power would be growth, because the base is 3. Um, 1.2 to the x power. Now, don't think like it has to be... Sometimes kids get confused with fractions. Um, there are fractions that are greater than 1. So if you have an improper fraction like this, we're still going to have a growth. And then the one that I always like to throw at kids that really tricks them, what if I put like 1 half as the original base, but then I raise it to the negative x power? Well, you think about what that negative x power means. It's going to reverse the base. It's going to apply the negative first exponent to both and then move the terms. So what you really have here is 2 to the x power. So that is an example of exponential growth. Uh, on the flip side of that, exponential decay would be some examples. Let's see, how about 0.5 to the x power? That'd be decay. Um, how about <laughs> uh, 3 fourths to the x power? That'd be decay. And then we're going to talk later about what happens when you throw a negative in front of the exponential function. The negative is not a component to the base. So, like, if we had negative 3, I'll write that down. So if you had negative 3 to the x power, the base is still the 3. The negative is going to be a reflection across the x-axis. So this is a growth formula that's been reflected across the x-axis. And um, there's other transformations that we'll talk about, but let's save something for the lesson. Abruzzo. Come on, girl. All right, so exponential growth. There's a nice example of what it looks like. Um, a very boring expon exponential growth function. Um, is going to have a y-intercept of 0, 1. This domain's negative infinity to infinity, range 0 to infinity. Um, this is, again, nothing that's been transformed or stretched or reflected, so all of this is going to stay consistent if you have what, what I refer to as very boring exponential growth functions. Uh, on the flip side of that, exponential decay, um, same domain, same range, but the shape looks very different because your function is dying as time goes on. Same y-intercept, so a lot of it looks the same. Uh, the end behavior is clearly different, though. On the left side, it's going to infinity for a decay. But on the left side, for growth, it's going um, to the asymptote, which is at the x-axis, which we will refer to as y equals 0 instead of saying the x-axis. You can say f of x equals 0 if you want to be super fancy. The other thing to note is that exponential growth is a constantly increasing function, and then exponential decay is a constantly decreasing function. So... Keep that in mind. Again, referring to those very boring ones. <clears throat> so this question is an example of a function one-third raised to the x power. So they already graphed it for you, but you see that this is most definitely an exponential decay. I could have told you it was a decay before we graphed it, though, because the base is less than 1. The base is technically between 0 and 1, but let's not worry about negatives right now. Um, they plotted some points, and then they gave you all those components of the graph, domain, range, 
Um, when they say intercept, they're referring to the y-intercept because this doesn't have an x-intercept. The asymptote is at y equals 0 or the x-axis, and then end behavior. They put it in limit notation for your book, but we'll use our regular end behavior notation if you don't mind. All right, so that should be very review-y. Let's talk about this guy, though. So this one has some transformations applied. The parent function is, remember, the, the boring function, the one that has nothing going on. So the parent function would just be 2 to the x power. So either way, it's a growth. Um, but this one has been transformed two ways. It has been shifted right one, and it's been shifted up one. So if you think about the asymptote used to be, for the parent function, used to be at the um, x-axis. If everything's been shifted right one and up one, that's going to shift the asymptote up one as well. And again, the normal parent function used to have a y-intercept at 0, 1, but if everything's been shifted right one and up one, I know it's going to go through that point now. And from here, it, I, I just kind of fudge these in. I know it's growth, so I'm just going to kind of do this. <laughs> uh, however, if you're looking for an accurate graph or we need to find some things in a moment, I might suggest you, you know, go to your calculator and plot some points. The domain is still going to be negative infinity to infinity for exponential growth or decay. It's not going to change. The range in this particular case, though, goes from 1 to infinity. Now, notice it's an asymptote, so we're not going to be hitting the value of 1 for the range, so we're going to put a parenthesis on it. Now, there's no x-intercept, but I do need to figure out who this y-intercept is. And you can do this a few different ways. I know the x value is 0, so the easiest way to algebraically figure it out is just to plug in a 0 right here. So you end up with 2 to the 0 minus 1 power plus 1. So that's 2 to the negative 1, so it's 1 half plus 1, so 1 1.5. Which, you know, if you guys were using your graphing calculator to get any component of this function, like table points, then I would just find your y-intercept like using the table or using your trace feature, because what's the point of using your calculator if you like, only halfway use it? All right, the asymptote is now at y equals 1, because it was shifted up 1. And then for end behavior, I'm going to erase this. Um, I'm going to leave it kind of blank for a minute. <laughs> so as my x's go to the left and as my x's go to the right is the other thing we need to think about. Okay, those are the two ends of my end behavior because they're not bounded on the, on the domain. So as my function travels to the left, it's, it's trying to approach the asymptote, which remember was at 1. And then on the right, it's going up, 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 which is infinity. And then increasing or decreasing behavior, it is always increasing. So it's increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity. So a lot of old topics are coming back with this. I'm going to call it a new function because it's new for pre-calc, but it's surely not new for you. As a math student, you saw this a lot in Algebra 2. Um, some more transformations to talk about. So 2 to the x plus 1 power. Remember the formula? Um, it's always x minus h. So it's like base raised to the x minus h power, well, a, times x minus h power plus k. So that built-in, oh my gosh, dyslexia, hello, x minus h. You know, you guys laugh at me when I say I have dyslexia, but it's the truth, man. All right, x minus h power plus k. So the horizontal shift is going to be opposite of what you think it is. So remember, this is really x minus negative 1. So that's going to be a left 1 unit shift. If I throw a negative inside of the x with the x component, remember that's the same thing as doing this. So we're going to have a reflection. This is kind of weird across the y-axis. So instead of having a growth that looks like this, we're going to be ending up with, oh, look at that, a decay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then here... We have a negative 3 in front of the function. So we are going to have a reflection across the x-axis, and it's been expanded vertically. So, um, if I move my picture out of the way, I think they already graphed it for us down here. So a reflection and then a vertical expansion of 3. Okay, man, we're just always in the way here, huh? All right, so let's talk about our friend E. E is a very famous number, just like um, pi very famous irrational number. E is called the natural number. Uh, funny name here. Yes, they, <laughs> it's pronounced Euler. Okay, Euler. 
poor guy. I'm sure that was mispronounced for the rest of his life. <coughs> um, this is often referred to as Euler's number. He's a famous mathematician, among other things. Um, it's the base of a natural logarithm. It's found a lot in nature and nature deriving problems. So that's why we refer to it as the natural number. And it's approximately 2.718. Um, but that's, you know, a few more digits there. It's just like pi. It never ends because it's irrational. You don't have to really understand too much about E, but it's a pretty cool concept when you move on to calculus. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over the derivation of what E is, but if I have E to the X power as my exponential function, remember E is like 2.718, blah, 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 blah. So if I raise that to the X power, that's definitely going to be a growth. It is um, a growth of base E, so we're going to find out that in some story problems it's going to show up a lot. So this is a transformation of that parent function of y equals e to the x. So the negative, remember with the x, is going to be a reflection over the y-axis. So that's the kind of reflection that, you know, instead of having it go up like this, it's going to have it go down like this. It's going to ref reflect over the y-axis. Oops, I didn't graph that very well. My bad. Um, domain is still going to be negative infinity to infinity. The range is actually still going to be 0 to infinity because the um, horizontal asymptote at 0 is not going to change. But what is totally going to change is the end behavior because instead of having a growth, we now are going to have a decay. So the intercept is still going to be at 0, 1. And if you didn't believe me, you would just plug in a 0 for this x right here. So e to the negative 0 power, that's dumb, it's e to the 0 power, which is 1. <laughs> the asymptote is still going to be at y equals 0 but the end behavior is going to totally change. So again, I would use table points if I was trying to get some good points here, guys, but it looks something like this. And then the end behavior is going to ask me about the left and right end behavior. So on the left, this time my function is increasing because it's technically a decay now. Um, and then on the right side, my function is approaching the asymptote which is at zero. And because now it's been reflected over the y-axis and now it's a decay graph, our function is always decreasing. So it is decreasing from negative infinity to positive infinity. You can say decreasing always. Um, the, the other important part of that answer is that it's never an increasing function, so keep that in mind. Okay, let's get my face out of the way again. So we're on another worksheet now. We're going to start talking about some story problem formulas that should feel really familiar to you because we did a lot of these in Algebra 2. I know even in regular Algebra 2 we did a ton of these. So the original one there is the exponential growth and decay model used when you have an initial amount or you want to find the initial amount and you're given a growth factor and it um, increases at that rate over time. Continuous exponential growth and decay is using the base of E. So we used this a lot in Algebra 2 when we asked for continual compounding of interest. And we called that formula PERT. Um, there's a little note here that I want you to make note of, though. Oops, <laughs> not that. Uh, it says blah, 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 rate of growth or decay. If it's decaying continuously, it's going to have a negative with that exponent. So just keep that in mind. And the compound interest formula is when you are compounding interest or compounding growth a certain amount of times per year. So it might say something like compounding monthly, but compounding annually, even you could use that, uh, semi-annually, daily. If they switch it and say continuously, then you have to go use PERT. But compound interest formula was the one with all the ends in it, if you remember that guy. So this problem is kind of displaying to you what happens when you compound at different rates or different amount of time. So we're using the compounding formula for all of this, but we already calculated this for you, so you're welcome. And if I have, uh, I don't even know, $300, there we go, <laughs> $300 investing at 6% for 20 years, but we're going to keep changing the N on you. So if we compound once per year, it's roughly $962. But if you collect interest twice per year, it's a little more, 978 is the final total in your bank account after 20 years. Now that might not seem significant to you, like, oh, it's not really that much, but um, remember all you're doing is simply collecting interest more often. It doesn't mean you get the full interest payment twice a year. What happens is it takes what will be your entire interest and it subdivides it over the 
you know, how many times you collect interest. So you're collecting a little bit of extra interest on your already occurred interest. So that's how that works. Now quarterly, you're going to get a little more, monthly even more, daily even more, and then hourly. Well, that's fun. Um, <laughs> even more. But again, remember, it's, it's only like a $30 difference over 20 years. So, I mean, it's, it's not significantly more because you're taking the interest and you're subdividing it. So moral of the story is if you're putting money into an account and there's nothing different other than one collects interest daily or one collects interest annually, well, you would rather make more money if that's the only difference. So just make sure you're looking for the highest m amount of compoundings if that's all that's different. But we'll find out that usually in the world that's not all that's different. All right, so if it ever says the word, I think I'm blocking it right now, but if it ever says the word compounding, <laughs> compounding continuously, oh, Lord Almighty, all right, try again. If it says compounding continuously um, right here, we're going to be using that PERT formula. Speak of the devil, PERT. <laughs> all right, so notice instead of 1 plus R over N to the NT power, it has E as your base. So still the initial formula or initial amount that you invest. And then instead of having a weird big fraction, we're just going to use the natural number E and then raise to the R times T power. Um, principle represents the amount that you initially invest or start with. So if it's exponential growth or decay, where I give you a growth or decay rate and then I give you a time that it grows by, you're going to be using this formula. They use N sub zero, but a lot of times... Um, they used A back in Algebra 2 to stand for the initial amount. It, you guys know by now, it doesn't matter what variables I use as long as I've defined them at some point for you. If your growth rate is um, greater than zero, <laughs> uh, we're gonna have, it's gonna be referred to as a growth rate. But if your rate is less than zero, it's gonna be considered a decay rate. So if you think about what's happening here, um, in Algebra 2, we wrote one plus or minus R inside that that formula because you're going to be adding to 100% if you're growing and you're going to be subtracting from 100% if you're decaying. Now, very different concept though if the word continuous shows up you have to make sure you're using the right formula. Back in Algebra 2 a lot of kids will use the wrong formula which really messes up your problem. Alright so here initial population of 100 so that's going to be our n sub naught and then the uh, reproduction rate of 25% measured per week and we are measuring our time in weeks. So they're just saying, like, that's your label for time. And we are growing. So this is going to be a 1 plus R formula. So our initial amount of 100, 1 plus 0.25. And they want to know how much is in there after six weeks. So after your time has elapsed of six. And I think I already did this one. So I'm grabbing my calculator again. Um, and we're counting cells in a colony. So it would make more sense to round to like the nearest whole cell. So I would just say about 381 cells. If you wanted to be more specific with decimals, you're welcome to. And if it doesn't specify, just use your best judgment. So this question, I even underlined it for you. Compounded continuously tells us that we're going to be using the PERT formula. So we're going to invest $1,000. So there's your initial investment at 5%. So there's your R continuously. And then they want the balance after 10 years. So there's your time. So using our formula, we have 1,000 times E to the careful 0 0.05 times 10. And this is all up in your exponent. So if you're using your new calculator, um, the TI-84s and beyond, um, you should just stay in the exponent. If you're using an older one, make sure you use parentheses around that. And you really don't need this multiplication sign here. It's going to assume you want to multiply them together, but whatever, it doesn't hurt. Now this is money, so if you think about the appropriate rounding for money, we're talking change. So 1648.72. Uh, by the way, the E is found a couple places on your calculator. I'll go ahead and show you that. Um, if you're using an exponent with the E, I always use the one that's above the natural logarithm button. Okay, so yeah, no one wants to look at that. Get out of there. So right above the natural log, it says e to the x. So that's the one I like to use if I'm using this formula because it automatically pulls up an exponent. However, there's another e over here above the division key. So if you choose to use that e, then you're going to have to insert your own exponent. It, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. There will be times when we just want to hit e. 
I'm going to pause for a moment. Okay. Uh, another example, we have financial literacy. Compared to, uh, compare the balance after 10 years. Ooh, there's your time. Uh, $5,000 initial investment. So there's our, I believe we called it principal in this formula. Um, 8.5%, there's your R. And then compounded continuously. Um, versus <laughs> compounded quarterly. So we're going to do this problem twice. Okay, so. <laughs> oh man, all right, try this again. There we go. Okay guys, I'm just having a little technical difficulty here. This is how my Monday is going. There we go. So the first time I do this problem, let's compare the continual formula. So, $5,000. Oh man, I'm telling you, this is not going to be my day, I can already tell. $5,000 compounded continuously at 8.5% for 10 years versus the quarterly investment would use that other large formula with the parentheses and the ends. So $5,000, one plus 0 0.085 over quarterly, so four times a year, and then up in the exponent, four times 10. So if I were to type those both in my home screen of my calculator, because I don't have any variables left, and I would round to the nearest cent, um, Let's see, looks like I didn't answer one of them. So this one over here is 1594.52. All right, let me go grab my calculator real quick. Type in the continuously one. So 0.085 which I know sometimes kids like to just do this step in their head and they'd write like 0.85, but knowing me, I'd mess it up, so I'm not going to do that. All right, so 1169823. I should write that down in my notes, too. All right, 5,000. <laughs> Thanks for checking with me. All right, so I don't think we're surprised to find out that it's a higher rate of return when you're compounding continuously because you're collecting more often. You're literally collecting continuously. So 11698.23. And they want us to compare. Well, guess what, guys? It's it's more on the continuous. All right. Spoiler alert, I suppose. All right. This question has data from 2000. Um, we started with 101,000 quadrillion thermal units of energy consumption and it increases at a rate of 0.5% annually, what, how much are we going to have in 2020? So you can use the compounding formula with the ends, but if it's just annually, um, that's the same thing as just using your growth formula. So my initial amount of, not that, 101,000. And remember, it's quadrillion, so when we get our answer here, we're going to have to throw a label of quadrillion thermal units on it. And we're growing, careful, 0.5% is 0 0.005. No, 0 0.005. There we go. And then 2020, we got to think about how much time has elapsed. That would be 13 years. So you don't need to use like the Y equals menu, you know, just type this in your home screen. And I already did this, so it approximately ends up as... 101658 approximate, you know, quadrillion thermal units. I have no idea what that means, but I'm just here to solve your problems, guys. All right. <laughs> Bio question. The number of rabbits in a field increases 10% every month over the last year. There were 10 rabbits this time last year. How many rabbits are there now? So you got to watch your labels of time. It's growing every month. So when they say over a year, your time that has elapsed is going to be 12 months. So um, this is a compounding once per month, technically. You don't need to use the compounding formula. That was just a regular old growth problem. So we started with 10 rabbits. Um, it's going to grow 10%. Oh, 
Hello. Um, and then to the t power it would be a 12. And we get a prox, and these are rabbits, so you wouldn't do a decimal of a rabbit, right? So approximately 31 rabbits after a year. Oh, the rabbit problem. I love that one. All right. <laughs> so moving on to some more examples. I remember keying this the first time, and I'm thinking, man, these are like problems that we did in Algebra 2. So I hope you feel like this is a review for you. A population this time for the town is declining at a rate of 6%. And the population is currently 12,462 people. Predict the population five and ten years using two different models. So um, for the first model, if it's annual decrease, we would start with two, 12, 4, 2, 6, and then decreasing at a exponential decay rate of 6%, and then to the x power. So when x equals five years versus when x equals ten years, I would kind of type that into my home screen. You could do your table if you want, but these are people. So these are approximate answers. Um, we're down to 9,119 people here, and then 6,693 people here. Now, same problem, but using a different decay rate, we're going to be um, decaying continuously. So remember your formula still starts out with the original amount. But then it's e to the, normally we say rt power, but because we're declining continuously, um, we're going to have to use the negative 0 0.06 t or x power. So when x equals 5 versus when x equals 10, and I think I already did these, I'm just going to steal my answers here. And it shouldn't surprise you to find out that continual decline is going to have a bigger impact. Um, it's approximately 9... 205? Oh, or not. <laughs> 68200. I don't know. It didn't. Let me think about that for a minute. Negative E. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Oh, I, yeah, I got you. I got you math up here. It's Monday. Leave me alone. All right, the next question. Um, identify the uh, rate of growth and write the exponential function. So this one always kind of messes with kids because we're going backwards to find the r. I can just tell you it all the time. So I noticed that 10 years have elapsed, right? This is from year 0 to year 10, let's call it. And we're going to have to think about this is not a linear growth rate, so it's not as simple as like finding a slope or anything like that. It's exponential. So when time is zero, you get this value, so this is our initial, and then when time 10 years goes by, this is our final amount. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up our equation, but instead of saying like, you know, A equals or final amount equals, we're going to start off with 2.25, and then our initial amount, remember, was 1.94, and we are growing, so 1 plus some mystery R, and then remember it was to the 10th power, because 10 years have elapsed. So your first step in solving this algebra equation is to divide by 1.94. And it's ugly. So you have, let's see, 1.1598 roughly equals 1 plus r quantity to the 10th power. So you can 10th root this, if that makes any sense to you, or you could raise it to the 1 tenth power. That would be the same thing as 10th rooting it. I like to use powers on my calculator because they're easier to type, but you could clearly use the nth root. So if you 10th root this or raise it to the 1 tenth power, you get, let's see, 1.01494 equals 1 plus r, and then subtracting that 1 over, you find out that the um, growth rate was... 0.015 roughly, so 1.5 percent approximately. And then use your model to predict in which year the population of Miami-Dade County will surpass 2.7 million. So I want to know when it gets to 2.7. We're going to be solving these algebraically in the very near future, but for now we're going to go to our calculator and we're going to graph it and estimate it that way. So go to y equals and it did ask me to graph this somewhere on my notes there. I'm going to probably skip that step because I don't care to do that. Um, remember our initial amount was 1.94. 
And then you just found your growth rate to be roughly 1.15. So 1 plus 0 0.015. You could have just said 1.015. That would have been.